Tashitele, and uh, welcome everyone to Tibet Talks. Denji Gyatso, Act of International Campaign for Tibet. I'm pleased to be your host today. Today we have two special guests joining us to discuss a new uh, book called Tibet Brief 2020 that is based on 10 years of collaborative research, analysis, and engagement with scholars of Chinese, Mongolian, Tibetan, and Manchu historical sources. It presents an extensive, in-depth examination of Tibet's historical relations with dominant empires in the region. This remains important because the People's Republic of China bases its claims on Tibet solely on an allegation that Tibet has been an integral part of China since antiquity. Our guest speaker today is an international lawyer, a mediator, an advisor in intrastate peace processes, and a professor of international law and international relations. He specializes in intrastate conflict resolution. He served as a UN senior legal advisor to the foreign minister of East Timor during the country's transition to independence, and also as legal advisor to the Central Tibetan Administration and His Holiness the Dalai Lama. In 2020, he was knighted in the Netherlands with the rank of commander in the Order of the House of Orange Nassau for his exceptional service to society with a global impact. He has a number of publications, Sacred Mandates, The Status of Tibet, History, Rights, and Prospects in International Law, and of course, the topic of today's discussion, Tibet Brief 2020, co-authored with Mik uh, Bolches. Please welcome, please join me to welcome uh, Michael. Michael, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Tenshila. Thank you. And Joining us today to lead the conversation with Michael is our uh, second guest, an ICT board member and Asia expert. She is currently president, uh, Committee for Freedom in Hong Kong. She writes frequently and is a contributing editor at American Purpose. Her writings have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Foreign Policy, and other publications. Previously, she has worked in the U.S. Senate, in the Department of State, and at think tanks and human rights organizations. My pleasure to welcome also Ellen Bork. Ellen, thank you so much for joining. Thank you very much, Tencho. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm so pleased to be part of one of these talks that I've been following for a while and I know have been really a source of great interest to people, especially during the pandemic. Um, and Michael is an old friend whose work has informed my own thinking and writing on Tibet. Um, so I'm delighted to be able to engage in this discussion about this new book. Um, Michael's work is really extraordinary for bringing history into the, the present and into all the things that we're trying to do on behalf of Tibet. Um, so um, actually in case, I don't know if anyone's seen it yet, this is the book um, that Michael and Meek have published. Um, I will uh, engage in a, uh, some discussion with Michael, and then I know we'll come back to you for moderating the question and answer period. Yes, and just for the viewers watching, uh, we'll be taking the questions at the end of the uh, conversation with Ellen and uh, Michael. So please post questions on our Facebook Live post, or you can also email them to comments at savetibet.org. Okay, so I'll turn it over to Ellen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Michael, um, this book, the, the cover is very striking. Uh, the title really says something. Would you mind telling us how you came to choose the title and what it, what it should tell the reader about what you're trying to achieve with the book? Uh, thank you, Ella. It's great to see you and to have this conversation with you. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity also to explain something about, uh, about this book and what, what it can do and, and why we have it. Um, well, the book is, is a brief or an, an information on the international legal status of Tibet and what that means for the international community. Uh, 2020 in the title um, refers to visual acuity, 2020 vision, the ability to see clearly. That's why for the cover of the book, we also chose uh, the eye chart that optometrists use with the words rights, legal status, um, history, state responsibility, sovereignty, and legitimacy, because that's what the book is about. It's also 
what the Sino-Tibetan conflict is about. Um, and, uh, and that's become difficult, I think, for, for many people to see. In other words, the crux of the conflict is no longer sharply in focus for many people. Um, the PRC is actively and forcefully maintaining uh, a smokescreen. Our memory of important events is fading and being replaced by Beijing's narrative on Tibet. And the terminology now commonly used to refer to Tibet, uh, both by governments and in the press and elsewhere, um, is conditioning us to lose sight of the truth. And all of this to the detriment of a resolution of the Sino-Tibetan conflict. Um, and of course, our, our, our book aims to address this. Um, as Tenchala said, the book is an outcome of a project by CREDA, a conflict resolution that, that I had, which mediates and facilitates in peace processes around the world. And we've seen again and again in that work that if the true nature of a conflict is not understood or is not addressed, chances of resolving it are minimal. That's why we wrote the book. Um, can you go back sort of a little bit, not to the beginning, uh, so so far to the beginning, but to this conflict, how it came about and give us some examples of things that have become distorted. Um, uh, and I know later you'll talk about um, how, how China has helped to distort them, but give us please some examples of things that people really don't understand or see clearly. Uh, yes, um, people disremember uh, most fundamentally that the PRC took Tibet by force 70 years ago uh, when Tibet was independent. Um, the international community has lost sight of the fact that the Sino-Tibetan conflict is, is an international conflict, that Tibet is an occupied country. Um, and that, that this comes with international obligations and responsibilities on the part of our governments. Um, and I believe many have lost sight of that. You know, we ask our governments to address human rights abuses in Tibet. And we don't see that raising human rights concerns without addressing the underlying conflict in its political and international legal dimensions strongly signals an acceptance of China's representation of Tibet as its internal affair. Uh, so, so yeah, people's vision has become blurry when it comes to the question whether the PRC has sovereignty over Tibet or not, or whether the PRC has legitimacy to rule Tibet. People are just not sure anymore. They've been sufficiently confused by Beijing's false propaganda narrative that claims that Tibet was always a part of China or since antiquity. So how could the PRC then have invaded Tibet if it already belonged to China, people ask. And people are unaware um, that they're now using the language that Beijing prescribes for us. And uh, the terminology of the PRC when they talk about Tibet. So you have to see that they've, in a sense, fallen victim to and are helping implement Beijing's strategy to change the discourse on Tibet in Beijing's favor. And worse, that the use of this terminology over time changes the way they themselves perceive the nature of the Tibetan conflict. Um, and, and so our book is, uh, is intended as a wake-up call in that respect. I think what you say is, is very uh, interesting as we, we see the way the PRC uses language and projects its um, core interests, so to speak, Tibet as a core interest, um, to Taiwan and that kind of thing. And they're, they're managing yeah. to, that, that's part of this whole picture that you're, that you're painting. Um, wh what is it that governments are doing uh, by either willingly or unwittingly really by, you know, in, in their attempt to, uh, for example, satisfied Tibet that you know, the, you know that the United States or other countries don't have any designs on Tibet, or by acquiescing on this point of sovereignty, or or even on history itself. Can you sort of shed light on what governments are doing? Why what they're doing is wrong? Um, I know you make a case for how this is essentially they're abdicating their own international legal responsibilities in that respect. If you were advising 
um, a government um, to stop doing what it's doing, what would you tell them they're doing wrong and what would you tell them to do? Uh, good question. Um, as part of Beijing's strategy to convince the world uh, that it possesses <coughs> sovereignty over Tibet, it pressures and coerces governments, also actually corporations and, and even um, organizations like museums around the world, to refer to Tibet as part of China and to use the language that conveys that. Um, and as you say, uh, using concepts of, of Tibet being a core interest of China, um, which essentially means that China determines uh, how you should speak about and behave in relation to its core interests um, as a prerequisite, in a sense, to friendly bilateral relations. That is a, that is a, a, uh, and it has proven to be an effective uh, means of, of uh, pressure on states to behave according to how Beijing wants them to, to, to behave. Beijing consistently uses carefully selected vocabulary when talking about Tibetan Tibetans and insists we all use it. Um, and this is intended to foster international acceptance of China's rule of Tibet and the sense that its incorporation in Tibet is not just lawful, but also irreversible. Good. Let me just illustrate as, uh, how this works with the term minority. Um, as you know, Beijing refers to Tibetans as one of its minorities or as an ethnic minority or ethnic group. Many people, including journalists, government officials, uh, and even NGOs follow suit. Yet this is, a, uh, this is a false representation of Tibetans. Firstly, Tibetans are the majority in their own country and not someone else's ethnic minority. Secondly, Tibetans squarely qualify as a people under international law, a qualification that comes with, with robust set of rights. The rights accorded to a minority or an ethnic minority um, are substantially less than those accorded to a people. And so by consistently calling Tibetans an ethnic minority and pushing others to do so as well, Beijing aims to affect our perception of the status and rights of the Tibetans under international law. Uh, peoples, for example, have collective rights under international law, which minorities do not. Most importantly, peoples have the right to self-determination. This right, as you know, is, is enshrined in the UN Charter um, in the first article of both international human rights covenants. Uh, so it has become customary international law, which means it's binding on all governments, on all states. And the realization of a people's right to self-determination has become a matter of international concern and responsibility. And so it generates obligations for our governments. So when Beijing insists on calling Tibet China's ethnic minorities, it's not, minorities are not the majority in China. Beijing's vocabulary is deliberate to change our perception of the rights of the Tibetans, our perception of China's entitlement to Tibet, and our perception of the extent to which the situation inside Tibet is within or outside uh, the purview, the responsibility uh, of the international community. And such a change in perception has an enormous impact on whether and how governments frame and address the Sino-Tibetan conflict. Whether a government conceives of Tibet as an occupied country and Tibetans as a people with the right to self-determination versus whether it considers Tibetans as an ethnic minority that have always been part of China makes a huge difference. Uh, the, the, the first, the former, signals that there is an international conflict in need of resolution. The latter signals that Tibet is China's internal affair and outside the international community's purview. The former signals that Tibetans have rights that China must respect. The latter signals that Tibetans demands are in fact requests for special favors from China, which Beijing is essentially free to ignore. <laughs>
So today the PRC is largely succeeding in getting governments, journalists, and even scholars around the world now to use its vocabulary. And this trickles down to the general public, um, not least because governments use it and that gets broadcast through the media. Uh, and this, this is happening now, this is the current situation. And as a result, our collective perception of the nature of the Sino-Tibetan conflict changes and inaction on the inaction on the political front uh, is the result of that. So, so China has it essentially where it wants us, in the corner where it wants us. I'm sorry for, for no, I'm, I'm glad long you, answer. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm very glad you went into it in that detail because it, it, it really is important to understanding, um, again, whether wittingly or unwittingly, uh, governments or, uh, you know, particularly governments who have, you know, in theory are attempting to advocate for the Tibetans in some way um, are aware of the, of the role they're playing by accepting this language, by seeding principles that you've described. Um, so maybe in that, you might address that a little bit in as we sort of discuss the the, the possibility of a, of a resolution of the conflict. Um, uh, you know, you, your your work is intended to, uh, I think, restore a balance or restore reality or restore truth and history. So that there can be progress on on some kind of resolution, um, and I wonder if um, you know you could talk about the prospects for such a resolution, but also you know what would have to happen were certain countries or you know those who purport to be supportive of of the Tibetans uh, to actually press for that. Are they is have they kind of uh, shot themselves in the foot or tied one hand behind their back? What would they have to do in order to to facilitate that? And what are the and what are if that weren't to happen or were to happen, what would be the prospects for some future kind of uh, movement on the resolution question, hmm. negotiation question? Prospects for for uh, for negotiations um, uh, are, are to a large extent dependent or affected by Beijing's perceived need to negotiate. And right now, as far as we can see, there, there is no perceived need to negotiate. And that is, and this goes back to, to your earlier question, actually. Um, there, Beijing does not feel the need to negotiate because our governments are giving Beijing what it wants by complying with China's terms on Tibet. Mm -hmm. In other words, our governments are not questioning Beijing's legitimacy to rule Tibet. In fact, they're willing to state that they consider that Tibet is part of China, some of them uh, repeatedly, even though international law actually, and this I think is important to know, international law prohibits governments from recognizing that Tibet's part of China because Tibet was invaded, um, uh, contra it was invaded in violation of one of the most fundamental norms of international law. So because governments because governments do not challenge China's right to rule Tibet, there's very little incentive to negotiate with Tibetans on political systems by the needs of Tibet. Um, let me explain a little bit more. The, the legitimacy to rule Tibet lies with the Tibetans, and this is the Tibetans' most important leverage in any negotiations. In a situation of power asymmetry, as is the case with Tibet and China. This leverage is dependent on it being upheld by the international community. And this is fundamental to the functioning actually of our international legal order. And currently the Tibetan leverage is being undermined by our governments and they're doing so in breach of international law. Every statement a government makes to the effect that it considers Tibet a part of China or that implies that the PRC's rule of Tibet is legitimate, or that endorses China's claim to sovereignty over Tibet, is another nail effectively in the coffin of a negotiated solution. So long as the international community endorses China's claim to Tibet, I mentioned as governments repeatedly do today, Beijing doesn't have an incentive to negotiate with the Tibetans. With, with those pronouncements by our governments, 
um, they are in fact selling out the Tibetans' rights and with them, the chances of negotiated solution. You know, as you mentioned, the stated policy of a number of governments, and that, that includes European ones, the European Union itself, the US and Canada, is that they support negotiations between Beijing and the Tibetans to restore their com to, to, to resolve their conflict through dialogue and negotiations. But the actions of those same governments undermine this policy and, and we also don't address that. The fact that their actions are illegal, we also don't protest against. And so we don't really hold our governments accountable. Um, and as a result, our governments are, are mostly paying lip service to the ideal of a resolution of a Sino-Tibetan conflict through negotiations. Um, and and uh, there seems to be a general feeling, uh, even among NGOs engaged in the issue, that this is enough, that realistically much more can't be expected of, of our government. And that's where we are today. And yet, the continued occupation of Tibet, which is happening on our watch, um, and the fact that governments look the other way and use language that exonerates China so as not to upset it, makes them, makes governments accessories after the fact. And I know this is a serious accusation. An accessory after the fact, as you know, is someone who assists a person who's committed a crime after the person's committed it uh, with the intent to help the person avoid punishment. And our governments do that. Uh, they intentionally help the PRC get away with the annexation, with the invasion and annexation of a neighboring country. And we let them do that. So uh, that really reduces the, the chances um, of the parties coming to a negotiated uh, solution. I wonder if you could shed a little light on on the uh, formal Tibetan position um, uh, seeking uh, autonomy, genuine autonomy under Chinese rule. Um, how then, if if that's the ultimate goal, um, how should we understand as you know, supporters of Tibet what our role should be? What what is it that um, how can how can our uh, the changes that you're suggesting that we make? How can those really help? Given what his Holiness's objective is. Well, I, yes, I, I can see how it can be confusing. Also, the fact that uh, I'm, I've been talking about the importance of not um, recognizing that uh, recognizing Tibet as part of China or legitimizing or giving the impression of legitimizing the Chinese invasion of Tibet on the one hand and what we hear from the central Tibetan administration and from His Holiness, which is we're seeking uh, autonomy, we're not seeking um, to separate from China. Um, uh, 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 I'll say by first saying something about the middle way approach itself, and then address how that is being undermined by, by these statements by governments and, uh, and others that I've just mentioned. So, so the middle way approach, uh, which is the name given to, as you know, to the um, uh, uh, to the Tibetan policy in terms of uh, how to resolve the Tibetan issue, is is firmly rooted in the Tibetan position that Tibet is an illegally occupied country, and that the PRC does not have the right to rule Tibet, and at the same time. It is rooted in a commitment to resolve the conflict nonviolently through dialogue and negotiations. Uh, it also includes the willingness to seek a mutually beneficial solution to the Sino-Tibetan conflict that does not require the restoration of Tibet's independence and that can be implemented through genuine autonomy within the framework of the PRC and its constitution. Quite a mouthful, but that is kind of, I think, comprehensively describes the middle way approach. Uh, now the middle way approach does not Im imply that the CTA accepts Tibet as part of China today. 
very much to the contrary. It means that if a satisfactory solution right. involving a robust and genuine autonomy is reached through negotiations, then the CTA will, as part of such a package, accept that Tibet will henceforth be part of the PRC and will not seek separation from it. In other words, the middle way approach holds the promise for the PRC that Tibet can lawfully become part of China and be recognized as such by Tibetans, but only in return for a genuine and robust autonomy, which, as you know so far, the Chinese have not been willing to discuss. So the desired outcome of the middle way approach, which is genuine autonomy for the whole Tibetan people, is a compromise. It's somewhere in the middle between the restoration of independence on the one end of the spectrum and integration and assimilation into China on the other end of the spectrum. But, um, oh, the, sorry. No, it's all right. Um, I'm, well, I, I'll just mention that um, you're, I cannot see you, that something's happened with the connection. Oh. I, can, I can hear you perfectly, so that explains why I might oh. interrupt you. Did I, did, I, did I interrupt or shall I? Um, uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to, to, to uh, finish the, the, uh, the thought um, that a, a confusing element is that this proposed compromise somewhere in the middle is also the Tibetans' bottom line. So the Tibetans, and in particular the Dalai Lama, have taken an unconventional uh, stance in stating their bottom line as the negotiation objectives. Mm -hmm. And that's confusing. And yeah. we're used to negotiating parties arriving somewhere in the middle after a give right. and take process that for both sides started with much more assertive opening demands. In the case of Tibetans, the opening demand is the compromise in the middle they are envisioning. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that's confusing. Yeah. Um, well, we're going we're getting towards the end of the our portion of the discussion, and soon we'll um, open it up for questions that Tensha will moderate. But I just wanted to ask you, you know, to give you a chance as we reach that point uh, to offer, you know, you've given some very specific criticisms of uh, not only what China's done, obviously, how the international community has responded to that. And um, I wondered if you have any suggestions going forward, what would what recommendations would you make uh, uh, based on, on all of this historical research and your uh, assertions about uh, Tibet's status and about what China's been doing uh, so effectively since it invaded and occupied Tibet? Yeah, so, um... Yes, and, and we haven't talked about the history, and which is a, uh, a substantial part of, of the book, although the book uh, deals with the rights of Tibetans and, and with self-determination and with policy choices for governments and so forth as well. Um, because I think that's, that's uh, uh, talking about the history in a conversation like this, uh, you know, it's a complex matter and it's, it's uh, best left for people to read uh, in the book. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, so recommendations in terms of what what people um, what governments in primarily but also others uh, including civil society can do um, well the, the the first and perhaps most simple thing is to call the Sino-Tibetan conflict and Tibet what they are in other words to use the language and and to press governments to use the language that reflects the truth about the international legal status of the Tibet and the Tibetans, and not to use language that perpetrates and solidifies the false representation of Tibet and the Tibetans. So Tibet is an occupied country, we should say so. Sino-Tibetan conflict is an international conflict, we should say so. And the Tibetans are an occupied people, not a minority. Uh, that's one. Um, and, and Tibet and China policy should uh, I feel, be premised on the treatment of the Sino-Tibetan conflict as a matter of international concern uh, and not as China's internal affair. Um, and this is, in fact, as, as I mentioned, a legal obligation of our governments. Um, Tibetan China policy should incentivize China's leaders to come to the table um, and should 
uh, center on denying China the benefits of its occupation of Tibet, including denying the recognition of its claim to sovereignty over Tibet until the conflict is satisfactorily resolved. This is kind of a basic, uh, basic approach to, to incentivizing negotiations. Second recommendation would be to urge governments not to raise the Tibetan human rights concerns without also addressing the underlying conflict in its political security and international dimensions. They need to go hand in hand. Um, the Sino-Tibetan uh, conflict is political. Uh, China's occupation is strategic and the human rights violations are the symptoms, the inevitable consequences of Chinese Communist Party pursuit of full control of Tibet. Ritualistically addressing symptoms, human rights in this case, without tackling the cause is not only, I think, a morally unacceptable policy choice, but it gives a way that governments are not really serious even about the human rights of the Tibetans. Mm -hmm. We all know Tibetans' rights have been systematically and grossly violated for 70 years, despite international condemnation. China's leaders are just no longer concerned about this kind of criticism and, and not motivated to act on it. So we need to uh, not address human rights only on their own without also addressing the political conflict. And, and then uh, we should urge governments to be mindful not to give to China what is not theirs to give. In other words, ruling out independence, for example, or making other concessions by governments regarding rights that belong to Tibetans, um, that those kinds of concessions are the exclusive prerogative of Tibetans. For any country to make such concessions not only takes away the leverage Tibetans may have with China, so reducing the chances of reaching a negotiated solution, but violates international law as well. And in the same way, not to accept or receive or purchase what is not China's to give. So it makes common sense, but Tibet's natural resources belong to the Tibetans, not to China. And governments or states are prohibited from acquiring those resources or good ma goods made by those without the prior permission of the Tibetan people. This, this was recently again confirmed in a case in the European court regarding Western Sahara. And finally, I think we have to hold our own governments and corporations and civil society actors too accountable for their behavior towards Tibet and China on all the points we've talked about today. Um, and I think that is from, from, you know, all of us in civil society, I think that is uh, perhaps the strongest message I'd like to convey. Well, thank you very, very much. I think it's, um... Uh, a lot to keep talking about, and I look forward to getting our uh, audience's questions. And I know Tencho has been gathering them, uh, so I'd like to ask her if she'd like to step in now and um, moderate this portion. Thanks so much, Michael. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Ellen, and thank you, Michael. Um, we uh, seem to have lost your uh, visual, but we can still hear you perfectly. So um, that's what counts. Um, I have a couple of questions here. I first have a, a question from a viewer from the Netherlands. Um, he, Uyghur Sherp, he writes, thank you so much for writing this book. Um, and, and for this talk, and he says, how are we going to bring this information into international politics and into the general media? I think one of the ways of doing it is by paying attention to uh, how Tibet is referred to, uh, what governments and others say, what NGOs say, and uh, making an effort to correct them making an effort to correct them with, substantiated with, with uh, good arguments and evidence. I mean, to, to give an example of the kind of statement that to me is entirely unacceptable for a government to make, 
Let me just use the example of the Danish government's statement in December 2009, after, um, after China protested because the Danish foreign minister met with His Holiness Dalai Lama. The statement, and I'll uh, have it here, I'll just read it. Um, I'll quote it. Denmark is fully aware of the importance and sensitivity of Tibet-related issues and attaches great importance to the view of the Chinese government on these issues. Denmark takes very seriously the Chinese opposition to meetings between members of the Danish government and the Dalai Lama and has duly noted Chinese views that such meetings are against the core interests of China and it will handle such issues prudently. In this regard, and this is, I think, the, the, the the key and really um, the statement that we should hold Denmark and similar uh, and governments that do similar statements elsewhere to account. In this regard, uh, the statement says Denmark reaffirms its one China policy and its unchanged position that Tibet is an integral part of China. Denmark recognizes China's sovereignty over Tibet and accordingly opposes the independence of Tibet. Um, so this is this is not just a uh, an attempt to smooth over a diplomatic uh, problem. It is a uh, a statement that lays on thickly and in three different ways that it reaffirms that Tibet is part of China. And not only that, but that Tibetans should not have independence. Who is Denmark to determine that Tibetans may or may not have independence? This is the kind of concession that I was talking about that governments should not be making and under international law are not allowed to make. So, um, and it really disadvantages Tibetans uh, if they reach the point where they're even negotiating with China because it, it, uh, it shifts the post away from the Tibetans' rights to the Chinese. You start from a position where you really have very little room to, to, to negotiate at all. So, I think um, when we hear or see these kinds of statements, and whether they're made by governments or, or um, uh, organizations or the press, I think um, we have a responsibility to take the trouble to, to respond, to call them to task, uh, and use historical, international, legal, or any other uh, moral arguments to, to do that. Very strong case there, uh, Michael. Uh, the next question I have is uh, from a familiar name to all of us, from Leslie. She says, "What would Beijing? What would give Beijing a need to negotiate? What would make them willing to negotiate?" I know you, Michael. You worked closely with uh, late Chairman Lodi, who led the rounds of negotiation with the Chinese. Um, and then since 2010, there have been none. So uh, how would you answer this question? Uh, I think uh, these days with this, this regime in Beijing, um, the impression I get is that they're not in the mood to negotiate about anything with anyone. Um, and so I don't see great prospects for negotiations with this regime with the current leadership in place. That doesn't mean that that uh, can't change. It also doesn't mean that with a, a uh, follow-up regime uh, or different leaders, that would not be possible. Uh, and things do change. So that's the only certainty we have, and we have to be prepared to, to act on it. Um, what, and I think this is, this is an important theme uh, that I've been trying to convey in, in different places and is also the theme in the book is that um, what China needs most from the Tibetans, in fact, perhaps the only thing it needs from the Tibetans and, uh, is uh, legitimacy. The legitimization of China's rule over Tibet or its claim to rule Tibet. Um, and it's really only the Tibetans that can give China this. So this is what needs to be highlighted. 
this is what's going to make China want to negotiate with Tibet. Um, and this is why the more governments in particular, but also the general public, but particularly this is why the more governments that uh, uh, seem to or imply that China has legitimacy to rule Tibet and make statements to that effect, the more that happens, the less China has any incentive to talk to Tibetans because it thinks it's getting this, at least a semblance of legitimacy from the international community as well. So it doesn't need to go to His Holiness the Dalai Lama or to uh, other Tibetans. It doesn't need to change its policies in Tibet. It doesn't really care that there's complaints about human rights. I mean, if it did, it really would change things in, in Xinjiang as well, in East Turkestan, but it doesn't. Um, so it, the only, the Achilles, P, the Achilles heels for China is the question of legitimacy, and they're very aware of it, which is why they're insisting so much that His Holiness has to accept, has to publicly state that Tibet has been a part of China. That is the only argument they have used to um, substantiate their claim that they have legitimacy to rule Tibet, that Tibet is part of China, is only a historical argument. They have never produced any other argument to justify their rule of Tibet. And so that is what cannot be handed to them without negotiating, without uh, Sub substantive um, uh, uh, compromise by them. In other words, without them giving something in return to the Tibetans, and the Tibetans have said that they would be satisfied with genuine, real autonomy um, in exchange for accepting China's legitimate right to be to exercise sovereignty over, over Tibet in some in some way uh, that is acceptable. So uh, yes, I think withholding recognition, withholding any implications of legitimacy for China um, uh, is the best and perhaps the only way to get China to negotiate. Uh, another question on, from uh, our, one of our Facebook viewers, Andrea Rosenfeld, says, um, how much of various stances of governments do we believe are due to fear of threatening China? I think most. I think mostly, uh, in other words, I don't think it is a conviction when governments make these statements that they really believe that Tibet is an integral part of China or that it was historically part of China or anything like that. Uh, although I think many officials are confused about it, I've talked to a number of them, that no, no longer are as clear on this as they used to be 20 years ago, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, um, which means that China's propaganda is having. But uh, I think there's, China has been extremely successful in um, in putting governments on the defensive in um, making them feel that if they step out of line when it comes to talking about Tibet and today also about Uyghurs and today also about Hong Kong, also about Taiwan, I mean, the list is growing. Um, soon it'll be Mongolia, soon it'll be uh, the South China Sea will be added to all these things that it has already uh, identified as core interests. Um, that if you step out of line, that something really bad will happen to you. And one of the things that is really bad that's going to happen to you is that China is going to be very angry. I have spoken to foreign ministry officials that give me as a simple reason for not raising a particular issue on Tibet, any issue on Tibet, is no, but the Chinese get really angry. They say, of course they get really angry. That's part of the strategy. You just in, they just intimidate you not to talk about certain subjects and you go along with it, which is absurd. It doesn't make any sense. So yes, China has been very successful at instilling fear that bad things happen, including that a diplomat gets angry if you um, 
raise issues that they're not happy with when it comes to Tibet. And, uh, and that, I think, is the main motivation for people not to uh, do the right thing. Um, coming over to India, we have a Facebook question from Sanjuk Pandel. Uh, he says, what role India can play in resolving Tibet issues? India, of course, is, is, uh, is key. India is uh, uh, an essential player in, in uh, resolving the issue or in helping to resolve the issue or in helping to bring sufficient pressure to resolve the issue. And of course, India has um, an enormous, it's enormously important for India. It's, uh, as you know, China is uh, threatening India's territory um, now more than ever. I mean, in the past uh, couple of years, there have been numerous incidents on the border. Uh, China has been uh, making more assertive its claims to uh, what it calls Southern Tibet, which is um, Arunachal Pradesh, a huge area uh, in Northeast uh, India, but also in Northwest India. Um, and so, yes, uh, India really feels the heat of China's presence in Tibet more than more than anyone else, um, except perhaps Bhutan and Nepal feel it as well, but they have they, they manage their relations uh, in a way that uh, um, that they consider right. Um, so yes, India India uh, is essential, uh, and I think that for India the same goes as for other governments. That speaking the truth um, is probably its own best defense, its own best. Um, shield from aggression from China. Uh, again, I'm sure that China has instilled fear among some in India that if it gets out of line uh, on Tibet, that really bad things are going to happen. Uh, but in the long term, the only way that India can, um, can protect itself is by speaking the truth. I mean, let's take a very clear example. Uh, China claims, as I mentioned, uh, Arunachal Pradesh. Um, it does not recognize the, and it does so because it doesn't recognize the border that was agreed to in a treaty between Tibet and Britain um, in 1914. Um, that is the, the border that is internationally agreed. Um, if India doesn't insist on the truth that Tibet was independent before China's invasion, then it has no leg to stand on in defending this border as being uh, the legitimate international border because uh, the Tibetan ceded territory as part of that uh, agreement with Britain. Um, and if that uh, treaty was invalid because, as China claims, Tibet was not independent at the time, then India cannot really defend its claim to uh, a part of that territory. So for India, it is extremely important that it uh, insists that Tibet was independent at that time, which it was. India recognized that Tibet was independent uh, uh, as soon as as India itself became independent in 1947, it sent an official note from the government to the government of, of Tibet, in which it was very clear that it was treating Tibet as an independent country with treaty relations, that it, it said it hoped uh, uh, Tibet would respect its treaty relations with India. Um, and yet now India, in a sense, is, has not uh, respected its treaty relations with Tibet by accepting at some point that uh, that Tibet uh, had become part of the PRC. And so I think India has to carefully um, course correct its position on Tibet. Um, and that perhaps will be a stronger signal than, than anything else that China uh, needs to negotiate with the Tibetans if it wishes to, to retain uh, 
sovereignty uh, claims over Tibet that, that anybody is going to believe. If India no longer stands as it does now on the position that Tibet's part of China, the rest of the world will start moving away from that position as well. Um, the rest of the world has been looking to India and India's position uh, right from the beginning, right from when Tibet was invaded and has kind of followed India's lead. So I think India is, is crucial, is critical here. But of course, India is also looking to other countries for support to, to enable it to make any, uh, any assertive, take any assertive position. So from that point of view, it's extremely important that countries like the United States, like uh, the European Union countries, um, Japan, Australia, uh, and uh, especially countries in, in Asia, um, uh, that they uh, um, modify their positions to an extent that it, it, it enables India to take a more uh, truthful and assertive position. Thank you for that, Micah. We have uh, a number of uh, questions still, but we don't have a lot of time. I'm going to I have two questions here, and I'm going to ask if you might uh, address them both um, briefly. Um, so we have uh, from Facebook, uh, Sebastian Richter. Um, he says, um, good evening, and my perhaps somewhat naive question to the guests. So it says, do you have an opinion about the political reasons for the occupation of Tibet? I suspect call for help is the propaganda version. So that is uh, um, the first question. And the Sorry, second, I didn't completely get that question. So he says he wants to know all about the political reasons for the occupation of Tibet. He's heard about the call for the, um, the you know, the... Chinese uh, liberation of Tibet version. So he is, um, I suspect, um, that's his question. Um, the more gen for a uh, more general question. And then um, from uh, Louisa Grave, we have another question. It says, Michael, did your research look into current Chinese government, uh, whether the current Chinese government is reliant on the always part of China since ancient times claim in the same way for Taiwan and East Turkestan, or whether there are differences? So it's a more complicated question. Yeah, okay. Um, the reason for the occupation, or the, the political reasons for the occupation of Tibet, um, Tibet occupies a very strategic place in uh, in Asia, in the center of Asia, in the heart of Asia. Um, Inner Asia or Central Asia, these, these terms are kind of used sometimes interchangeably, but the, the if you like, the center of, of Asia or Eurasia is strategically important for all the big powers there. It's important for India, it's important for China, and it's important for Russia. And so that is part of the reason why throughout history they Areas that have been contested and have been um, uh, um, the subject of, of competition. Um, so, one very important reason I think for uh, China to have invaded Tibet was strategic. China would not today be a, um, uh, would not have access to South Asia. Um, it would only be an East Asian power, essentially, if it was not in Tibet. Um, and so I think that is, that's an essential reason for it. I mean, just look at also how, um, how important it has been for it in relations to, um, to Nepal today, uh, in its relations with Bangladesh in the past, uh, now with Pakistan, all of that Tibet has a central role to play because as you know china um, uh, has a, a very strong military presence in tibet that kind of dominates this area so strategic is is very important i think natural resources has always been part of the equation uh, even though the prc did not develop that fast in the beginning and that is largely because there was no infrastructure and it's taken them a long time to build the infrastructure that they need to, to truly exploit Tibet's natural resources. But um, 
that is an important part of the equation. Um, uh, there is um, an additional reason which has to do with the, uh, in a sense, the psychology of um, Chinese imperial dynastic thinking, which is that every new dynasty has to prove its legitimacy by expanding the empire, by expanding the territory, by expanding the sovereignty, uh, the reach. And uh, Tibet was, I think, part of that um, process by Mao Zedong. And letting it go would be unacceptable for the same reason, because losing a part of territory under the same psycholo psychological thinking is a signal of the beginning of the loss of legitimacy to rule China, not just to rule Tibet, but to rule China. So, um, and you, you can see that each new leader, even within the communist system, has tried to expand their sovereignty in some way, whether it is by uh, um, expanding the sovereignty to Hong Kong or uh, to some in some other way. So, um, so that's, that is, I think, an, another reason for uh, the invasion. The claim that Tibet was liberated from imperialism or from imperialist forces is completely nonsense. I mean, there were just no imperialist forces in Tibet. Yes, Tibet had relations with Britain, um, uh, but that doesn't make it Tibet a colony of Britain, and it wasn't a colony of Britain, and there, were, there was no military presence of the British. There was simply a diplomatic representative, which which one has in every country. So that, that is a completely bogus uh, claim by China, but one which they have broadcast widely, and which I think uh, even at the time when they invaded Tibet, a number of people suspected might have been, uh, there might have been some truth to it. Uh, but I think certainly uh, Chinese in China, Chinese population in China, many of them believe that. Um, and uh, so, uh, in terms of the, the comparisons with Taiwan, uh, East Turkestan, historically, um, uh, there are differences, and the differences are, are quite major and quite important. Um, uh, and one might add uh, uh, Mongolia as well, both both independent Mongolia and inner Mongolia. The history of all of these regions in relation to um, Eastern empires or inner Asian empires uh, in the past have been different. Um, at the same time, there are similarities. The, sim the, the main similarity, I think, between Tibet and East Turkestan or Xinjiang, as people uh, tend to call it, because that's the name that China has in the Eastern region, um, is being ruled with a almost typical uh, colonialist regime. Both of them are today, in effect, colonies of China. And it really angers me in a way that, you know, we have um, the world has made such a big effort to ensure the decolonization of all former colonies in the past century, uh, and I think did a, did a good job of that. Um, I think that is one of the one of the things that we can be proud of, and that we can be proud the UN helped to achieve. And yet, we allow the continuation, or in fact, a uh, a new creation of colonies in the middle of last century. Uh, and we allow that to happen without uh, calling China to task. But if you really look at the criteria of colonialism, uh, all of them uh, apply to Tibet and to East Turkestan. Uh, of course, Taiwan not, because Taiwan is independent, except that China doesn't, doesn't accept that and that much of the world doesn't recognize it uh, as independent. But the other thing that they all have in common is the historical argumentation from the PRC side. From the PRC side, all the argumentation for all three of these and for the South China Sea has been uh, and is 
that because these regions had uh, a, a particular relationship with um, empires that ruled China, therefore they are or they were and should be today part of China. In other words, they project um, today's borders of the PRC as they have established them into the past, into history, and reinterpret history in a misleading way to, to show that these all these territories have always been part of China, have, have some simply on the basis that they had some relationship, not even with China, but with rulers or empires that ruled China with the Mongols, for example. Tibetans had very close relationship with the Mongols and was in fact, Tibet was part of the Mongol empire, just as you know, Eastern Europe and, and uh, Persia and all of Central Asia and China were all part of the, the Mongol empire. With the Qing empire of the Manchus, we can say the same. The Tibetans had a close relationship with the Manchus, but Tibetans did not have a close relationship with China. It was not part of the Ming, which was the Chinese empire. It was not part of China when the Manchu Qing ruled China. The Manchus very clearly, the emperors made a very clear distinction between their relations with Tibet and their rule of China, which they occupied. Um, and so the same kind of argument is being used by uh, by China for East Turkestan and is being used uh, about Taiwan. And all of them really amount to this. Uh, think in terms of the, the, the Manchu dynasty or the Manchu empire uh, of the Qing and the Mongol empire of uh, uh, Genghis Khan and his successors. It would be as if India were to claim today that because it was the jewel in the crown of the British Empire, and China was undoubtedly the jewel in the crown of the, of the Manchu Qing Empire, that because it is a jewel in the crown of the British Empire, India uh, has sovereignty today over Burma, over Nepal, over the United States, Canada, Australia, I mean, if you see it that way, it is completely absurd. But yes, there's arguments being used. Thank you, Michael. You gave us a lot to, uh, lot in this one hour. And of course, there's a lot more. Um, we have in three of uh, Michael's book, um, we have also sacred uh, mandates and also the original status of Tibet, uh, which uh, we all uh, carry on our bookshelves and go to very often. Um, thank you, Michael, for all your research, all your work. Ellen, thank you for hosting. Ellen, would you like any uh, last comments, remarks? No, no, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. It's, it's really been a pleasure. And, and I'm sorry that the video, uh, uh, it still has a little thing on my screen that says reconnecting video, but it's never managed to do that. Uh, but it's been a pleasure you talking fine, with Ellen. you and with Ellen. Uh, and I, uh, I hope that it's been of some, some benefit. Very much. And then uh, for our viewers, um, uh, we are, uh, we'll be, we hope to have Michael's books on our web store. So please uh, keep a watch uh, for that or, and we have some copies here also if you want to contact us uh, directly, um, uh, we'll let you know. Um, so with that, uh, we end uh, today's uh, Tibet talk. Thank you everyone uh, for tuning in. Um, and we'll be back uh, next month with another episode. Uh, we'll be featuring a conversation with the authors of Sarah Monastery, another uh, an incredible book about one of the great uh, monastic universities of Tibet, scrupulously researched uh, from its founding in the early 14th century to its current state, 
will be joined by um, Professor Jose Cabozon and Guillem Pema Dojila, uh, the co-authors of this book, who were themselves former um, Sarah monks. So um, you will learn more about it at safetibet.org slash live. Again, thank you for joining us. And until next time, as my co-host Ashwin Vergis will say, stay safe, stay well, stay active. Thank you. <laughs>